We should talk about strong female characters, Natalie. That's why we're here. <laughs> well, maybe we can start with voice. Let's start with voice. Yeah. I thought that the voice in your um, your novel was very compelling, and I liked the different voices of the two women. And how did you do that? To to well. And I'll say as well, like what's really interesting is that this this much of what happens in your book, My Notorious Life, which takes place about 30 years later in New York, um, is is um, so it's it's actually happening at around the same time that Mia is traveling across the country, and Mia herself has been given up for adoption. Like so, your character Axie is a character who's who's again like one of these children of the working poor who when circumstances um, become terribly dire because her mother dies, becomes an orphan and has to find her way. Um, so her voice, I think, and in the same way that Miette's voice represents a kind of, um, uh, this kind of embedded levels of, of history and of the people who've influenced you and of the place that you grow up in, reveals so much about the, the kind of socioeconomic landscape of, of where people arrive in the world and how they make, and so what I love about Axie is how her voice also changes as, as her lifestyle changes and her surroundings change, but it retains, it always retains some of that, um, some of that streetness mm -hmm. that, is, that is the Muldoon you know, <laughs> that she is. And with Miette, um, she has to have a voice that is in some ways, um, some ways represents both her um, idiosyncratic a uh, very gentle and liberal priest father, uh, Canadian, French Canadian, and her um, and her own individuality and her her relationship with a, a woman uh, Zita, who's uh, um, a Blackfoot uh, woman who's very supportive and helpful of her through her life, and you want as well to get some of that sense of the parallel personality, the the right. kind of the person who will help no matter what, even when it hurts them to help. Yeah, I think one of the the things about voice and uh, the strength of a character is to make the voice be particular and specific and unique and one of the fun parts for me about writing this novel was that the attitude of the character it, it was she was angry and it was and she was irreverent and it was fun to write a character who has that that anger uh, fueling her she has lots and, of tenderness and, too, though. And, yeah, as as as, but it, but I wonder if if all strong female characters have to have um, it, can can a strong female character be weak or chipper? can it be chipper or can a <laughs> strong female character be be um, a sort of hot mess of self loathing and <laughs> and um, self doubt that so many women who are quite strong might describe themselves as? You know, I don't see that in your characters who are who deal with a, a lot of adversity, you know. There's a lot of moments of like real fury and self-doubt in terms of, and reasons that, many, many reasons to stop on this quest, right? right? And I think Axie has that as well, that sort of, there are times when that, the, the sense of like, I'm just, I'm just a really poor orphan. Like, I'm just a kid with no parents, my armless mother died, right? <laughs> and I can't find anybody to love me and this is how I feel in the world, even when I'm established in society, right? So I think that one of the keys to a really powerful woman character is directly addressing the many, many levels of emotion in complicated people, and the many motivations that go, that, that go into taking an act that is against social expectation. Right, you need many motivations, not just one. You don't just get born and say, you know what I'm gonna do, even though I've got nothing, is I'm gonna become a figure that helps people and risks my life doing it over again. As Calamity Jane did, taking care of people who, who died of yellow fever, strangers. Right. She's an alcoholic woman, sober enough, like a serious alcoholic woman, dies of alcoholism, um, sobers up for weeks on end to, to minister to people dying of yellow fever, and you, you die by shitting yourself to death, right? It's like not, something that people just do because it's heroic or chiv chivalrous or it looks good on you, right? Like she's going into these tents on the outside of cities where people have been taken away from their families because everybody's afraid of dying and holding their hands and bringing them water and risking her life doing that for strangers over and over and over again. So maybe, maybe part of what you're talking about when you 
I, I really think there's a hunger now for strong female characters. You know, yeah. you hear that all the time in the movies, and you know, you have to have role models for children, and you have Katniss Everdeen shooting bows and arrows and mm -hmm. leaping through hoops of fire. Uh, but I think, I think the way we understand in literature a strong character, somebody who's very memorable, and so, so. Calamity Jane clearly was a memorable character in history, but we don't really know much about her real life, just as, you know, Madame yeah. Restelle was completely lost to history. She was always in the headlines, and yet most of us have never heard of her. I never had. And so to take um, a, a, a larger-than-life historical figure and to make her come alive, yeah. it's, it seems to me a question of what it, you know, what is your fictional character going to choose to do? Say, oh, poor me, I'm a victim, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, and this is, it's a really terrible, and whine about it so that a, you get a whiny voice. Or is the character going to choose to deal with it and suffer as your, your, your characters are plucky, despite whatever um, misery they're, yes. they're going through? So are yours, but one of the things I'll point out is that both women are in a position where they, what can they do? They can die or they can go right. on, right? right? Exactly. They can, like, your, your, your horse, you know, your horse is <laughs> yes. facing a wolf. You don't actually get to say, no, not today. I, just, well, I cannot handle this right now, right? Um, you know, or in, in the case of many of the women uh, who are coming to Axie, which she recognizes as this woman, who's also a midwife, also helping women by providing you know, good, proper care, women who would die in childbirth as well, right? Is that she's realizing that they don't have, they have a limited set of choices from which they must choose. And she has chosen from her limited set of choices to, um, to minister to and, and help these women. And yes, at the same time, what she gets to continue doing is eat, right? Initially, that's it, right? Is that I, she really starts doing this because I can starve, or this is the one thing I can think of doing. It well, it's the same with Miette, and she really, yeah. she sets out to find her mother, and that's the question that really pulls you through the narrative. Is she going to find her, or is she not going to find her? Um, but it, it is a question of, um, I, I think it's very interesting to write about women who defied or went against the expectations of their day, and both, yeah. both Miette and Calamity Jane do that. <laughs> They're women who were completely out of the norm, and they were criticized for being um, radical in their own way and yeah. for contravening expectations of femininity. Mm -hmm. And so that is one definition of strength, although at the time it was seen as um, aberrant or evil or strange. Or you know, you have wonderful passages describing uh, reactions to. Clamity Jane dressing in men's clothing and to join the army, yeah. joining the army and wearing pants, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, which was illegal in some parts of the states at the time uh, for a woman to be disguising herself as a man, which is where wearing pants is. You, can, of course, cannot tell that I'm a woman, <laughs> um, but yeah, there, that's the big reveal. Okay. But what's really fascinating to me is that what we need to, um, when it comes to that question of like, why do we like strong women characters? Mm -hmm. And in both our cases, we're talking about people who come from the working poor. Mm -hmm. So there's an incredible amount of variety in terms of the roles you occupy when um, there isn't the economic um, strata that provides you a role where you don't get to work. Yeah, where you're a hot house flower. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not that's the reality of the vast that. majority right. of, of people in the world. And historically, like one of the things that was interesting to me when I thought to myself, I, I think I'll write a you know, I think I write, I'll write a Western. I'm living here in the mountains, in the Rocky Mountains, and I'm really having this first exposure to the, to the histories of the Old West, and that border between, uh, between Alberta and Montana is very porous, and a lot of the histories are flowing back and forth about um, the reservation systems, about um, the settlers, and I'm discovering how much more complicated and international and multiracial, and how much more there is to it than I knew from my cowboy and Indian uh, Lone Ranger, loving the Lone Ranger as a child, uncritically, um, and not knowing, you know, how much was obscured by those stories. I think that's the one great thing fiction can do yeah. because it can redeem the history that we've all been taught. I think we've all heard, for example, that 
you know, women in the 19th century were Victorian and pure, and we don't know that, that abortion was much more common than, than we've ever heard. Maybe one in five pregnancies ended in abortion, and that if you or said adoption. Or adoption, you know, and that the birth rate was, you know, if you, you, if you hear statistics like, oh, in 1800 the birth rate was seven women per children, but by 1900 it was less than four women, women what was going on? Um, the statistics are dry, and yeah. uh, a lot of it is, is hard to really, it just seems so long ago, but reading about Calamity Jane and her, you know, the, the emotional, her emotional life and the fact that she had a child or might have had a child, that this is what it was really like to be. That, yeah. that novelist question, what was that like? What if this, yeah. what if I was there? This is a fun question to explore and understand history, I think. And Apsy, I mean, both Calamity Jane and Apsy are criminals. Are, are at certain points in time, like are, are. But that, to me, what's really interesting about your building out, see, out of what ephemera we do have about history, demonstrate that there were real women. These aren't just strong women characters. There are these real strong women throughout history that have been obscured by other stories. Yes, and we're told that they were that they were weak and or feminine, that yeah, meaning weak. So, um, so to find that no, in fact, there have always been women like this who fight against the the stereotype and to to write them, whatever their difficulty <laughs> yeah. is, is a great exercise in fiction. I think that's a very um, important role for novels. Yeah. Yeah, because what I discovered was that there was there were numerous women, women ranchers, women miners, mm -hmm. women running their own businesses. There were, you know, Deadwood, South Dakota had one of the largest Chinatowns in, in the States at the time. While we think of the Dakotas, we think of Deadwood in particular as this kind of like um, um, perfect example of the Old West and Americana. At the time that Calamity Jane was first there, it was, it was not part of the United States yet. And so in fact, it was a place after the Civil War where many people fled to find a new life, to reinvent themselves. And so, um, and in terms of Axie, what's really interesting to me, because she's, you know, Miette's over here, and Axie's literally, you know, mm -hmm. at the same time over mm -hmm. here in New York. And so there are some, some references that are very close in the, in the two books, which I found fascinating. Axie, as what you do, building this character, this, this really valenced, um, realistic, emotional character who has many, many, many motivations, um, out of this ephemera about this famous criminal is demonstrate that what, you know, that Axie as a criminal, well, that's a matter of law. Axie as a person, as a matter of fact, is what you try to get at mm -hmm. by putting together those little pieces and imagining, well, who is the woman? Who is the person? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, uh, where, where strength comes in a character, but I think that with Miette and, and Martha, or Calamity Jane, as she's known, I, I thought it was very interesting the way you explored her, um, the, the many myths about her, and what might have been true, and all the different ways that her story could be told. And often, these stories are told in the newspapers first, and then those things become legends, and almost they become lies. And we begin, yeah. they go down in history as truth, but if you start to poke around when you, you see a headline like the wickedest woman in New York, or and you see the rootin' tootin', yeah. you know, tobacco chewing calamity Jane, you kind of have this um, cute image of her. And and yeah. you think if you dig just below the surface, well, what what was that? What was she really like? You know, what if you, how to get peel away the crust and the layers of myth and rumor and 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 misogyny <laughs> yeah. um, that was, were the, was the first draft of history, and say, wait a minute, you know, how do we reinterpret that? How do we, how do we decide what was really going on there? Yeah, and I tried to look at her as somebody who the reality, as, as I very quickly discovered that you can't, with figures from the Old West, verify very much at all, including who they were at birth, um, or when they were born, or, um, and Calamity Jane, I think this is true of Axie in terms of the re reporting around her as well, is a figure who rose to fame during her lifetime in part because of the coincidence of technologies in America, this, you know, this uh, country that was trying to bring back these seceded states and create an idea of itself as a United States that was not at that point united, was looking for stories that 
would help make the nation dream itself into being. Help it think of like who could be the heroes, who are the examples. And so people like Wild Bill Hickok, like Buffalo Bill, they were, they were figures that arrived not only at that political moment, but at the moment of the printing press and the dime novel. Yeah, so it was about the media. So the and it was about looking for stories. So, so Axie's advertisements were the first, the first way that people found, found out about midwifery. Midwifery was always a woman's province, but here was, she was advertising these medicines and these services, and doctors sort of said, hmm, that looks lucrative. Let's get the midwives out of the at the delivery room, or you know, yeah. Calamity Jane becomes this media figure. She's she's a, a Barnum figure. She's and, and it's it's entertainment. And you see in the 19th century so many roots of all of the things we think about so much now, and the, the debates we're having. And the, yeah. The, uh, you know, so before before the press and the penny papers, you've never known of Calamity Jane or Madame Rastel either. So no, and neither of those reports are really about those people. They're about who the reports need them to be in order to fulfill a narrative, right? Mm -hmm. So this kind of like she-devil, um, monstrous creature that actually becomes in the headlines is in part a character that is needed to fulfill these, the, the narrative role that those headlines desire, mm -hmm. right? When you write a novel a set in the present, I mean, and I, I am interested in the question of a, of a strong female character. I mean, so, so many of the people that we think of as or memorable strong female characters are not necessarily those muscular, I'm going to stand up to authority mm -hmm. kinds of figures. Um, and, and you've written novels set in the present as well, so it's not just oh, a yeah. historical. How do you go about, about making your characters memorable? What are, what are you reading? Well, when I decided to do um, a novel that dealt with a historical period, mm -hmm that I discovered very quickly was very elusive in terms of what you could demonstrate. I decided to embrace that elusiveness and include all of the many stories about Calamity Jane as part of who she is in popular culture and still is and still kind of operates on the popular imagination because I felt like it was really important. Um, in some ways, the fact that I found so many incredible stories about strong women doing all these incredible things in the nonfiction that hadn't arrived in the fiction, I felt like by putting them into fiction, you put them into the popular imagination, mm -hmm. and you help people think about what can be done because it has a context, mm -hmm. right? So you have people like Aunt Sarah Sally Campbell, who was um, a black woman, a cook, who came, who was born into slavery, but became the, not only the first um, black woman, but the first woman to own a mining claim, and then, be, and then on many mining claims, became a very successful um, financial genius um, at the time, um, so much so that the locals developed, out of fondness for her, developed this name for her that she was an unbleached American, right? Um, and so, you know, there are these incredible, interesting, fascinating stories about things that people had done, and I thought, it's important that they enter the fiction um, in any way that they can. I did contextualize them in terms of, you know, like this is a picture of Calamity Jane that appeared on the Dime Store novels. She didn't look anything like that. Mm -hmm. But this is this is an image of Calamity Jane that became popularized and appeared on in cards that you find in cigarette packs that she would have found in her own cigarette packs. At least she's right. <laughs> the pictures of Madame Rastel are yeah. all of a scowling bat woman. She's <laughs> bat holding a, a dead baby, the bat is devouring the baby, and, and yeah. you know, she always looks she always, she's always looking hideous and she's described as, you know, foul and evil and yeah. disgusting, and, and it's really very hard to get past that image to say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, even, even the New York Times recently read an article about her fabulous mansion and her real estate um, holdings in New York City recently, and they still spoke of her ghastly crimes, and they yeah. still spoke of her odious career. Um, but I think when you go down the list, I was trying to think of, uh, of the way we've been taught to think about women characters, and you know, you, it's, it's almost Halloween, so witches, yeah. bitches, <laughs> Pollyanna goody goods, saints and virgins and sirens and sex pots and nymphets and the frigid re refrigerator stair stepford wives, um, evil stepmothers, servants, wallflowers, moms. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's, the, the trick really for, for a writer is to do what Natalie does very well, is just to show a person in, in all of their complexity.
complexity and confront them. You know, good fiction sets up obstacles and, and you see how the character deals with them and, and the character comes out of how the <coughs> actions they take and you know, the attitude they have toward their yeah. circumstances. Yeah, I read in Deadwood recently um, and I didn't know, like, it, for me it was this like heart in my mouth moment, like if they hate me in Deadwood, I'm gonna die. Right? It's just gonna, my heart's gonna be broken and I'm just gonna fall down on stage. <laughs> and um, a woman came up to me before I went on and she saw a picture of Clarence Jane. She said, I petitioned to get her pictures down out of this town because the woman was a whore and an alcoholic. <laughs> and I wrote letters, I wrote letters over and over again, I want you to help me. And I was like, no. You come to the wrong place. You come to the wrong place, and also it's true. You know, at a certain point in her life, she was not. She was a prostitute. She was definitely an alcoholic. She pretty much worked every kind of, of job that she could. Um, but she also did all of these other things. And uh, so it was very moving to me to see this this these people who live with this history every single day. Um, embrace this idea of all of those things in one, as opposed to the, the Saint Calamity Jane or the Demon Calamity Jane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always nuanced and complicated, and I hope that we'll see a lot of novel, novels about women soldiers and women pirates, but also, you know, women who sit in libraries and read books. You know, it's just a yeah. question of the voice and the attitude and the, the way that a writer makes language exciting. Anything, you know, a good writer can make Look interesting, you know. So uh, these are these stories are tailor made for adventure seekers and people who like plots. Do you think um, anyone has any questions for us? Uh, the big read book that this event is inspired by is written by a male, um, yeah. and has a strong female character. Are there any male writers that you can think of that seem to have gotten it right? Uh -huh. Your reading history. Yeah. Um, Norman Rush's book, no, Mortal, um, sorry, uh, Mating, is a very good example of that. Um, the Louis de Vernier writes fantastic women characters. Roddy Doyle's The Woman yeah. Who Walked Into oh Divorce about, about a, a victim of domestic violence is written in the voice of a woman and you'd never know that a man wrote it. It's pitch perfect and it's just shatteringly beautiful. Yeah. So sure, of course, there are many men who get it right. Yeah. There's many who don't. <laughs> <laughs> One would hope, I mean, I, when I was writing this book, I was thinking about women's histories and these missing gaps and how much, you know, I wanted my daughter to know about, um, I felt like the maternal line was as important as the male line, but I wanted my son to, to know those things too, right? One would hope that this is about a fuller glimpse of where we all, uh, where we all come from and imagine ourselves. Anybody else? <laughs> really interesting now to me the way that um, in your book you have these glimpses of Mimic Jane when she's young yeah. as well. And then that kind of is cut between her young daughter too. Mm -hmm. And I wondered when you were writing it, did you write, um, you probably didn't write it front to back, but did you write their sections side by side thinking about how they were parallel as two women when they were girls or, or that type of thing? I guess I'm really just asking about your process of yeah. overlapping two characters. Well, you you should speak as well to Axie as a young girl because that's another way of humanizing a great a great way of humanizing Axie was showing her as a little girl who came from the same circumstances. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was writing the book initially, I thought to myself, um, it was about Miette, and she was this was before my children were born. I have seven year old twins, and um, a boy and a girl, and. I was thinking of it as this story of an angry girl who'd been given up for adoption and who wanted to know where she came from. Um, and who didn't want to know and wanted to know and didn't want to know and wanted to know. And the necessity of understanding certain things about herself. But then I had my children and I thought, no, it has to be a dialogue, right? It has to be the story of, of, of knowing a context for yourself. And I wanted to show, um, so it's, it's these two, um, uh, picaresque stories really braided together. This, this is sort of the journey of the rogue um, adopted daughter looking for the mother and encountering many people along her way is braided with the journey of the rogue of her mother traveling through her life to become who she becomes. So Axie yeah. as a baby, as yeah, a child. She, I, I think um, 
she's a, she's a street girl, she's a scrappy girl, and um, she gets swept up in the orphan train movement, which was not something I knew much about, but there were 30,000 homeless children living on the streets of New York in the 1850s and 60s, and uh, in a 50-year period, almost 250,000 homeless or orphaned kids were shipped west mm -hmm. in trains with a chaperone in hopes that they would find a home. And many of them did find a pie and pony, <laughs> little china doll, but many of them became servants or slaves or, or worse. And um, so Axie swept up in this, in this orphan train movement, which really did exist. And um, she ha gets separated from her brother and sister, and she spends the book trying to rejoin her family. She searches for them. And yeah. So the orphan train movement, you know, she, she does arrive as a, she wants to be a high society, high class woman. And so in the beginning, as she's speaking, you can still hear her broken and ungrammatical voice, but more, she constantly tries to correct herself and to be proper and to be fine and to be accepted by, by, by high society in New York. She's an airy beast. She's a striver, like many Americans, like many of our ancestors. And uh, she's a very much of a New Yorker, I think, <laughs> in that way. So anybody else have a question? Um, I, I love that list of women characters that you just rolled out, and it isn't so untypical today to look at you know, celebrity women or famous women as what you're describing from the 1800s. No. So in terms of writing strong women characters currently, what parallels would you see between that and the strong women? Everybody always wants to put someone in a box, like a, the, the sex pod box, or the virgin box, or the sainted box. I think that, you know, I, th I think it's the same thing. Uh, we, we have maybe more luxury now to, to um, make whole characters, to make women complicated, and, and to tell stories that, that are important. <laughs> My eighth grade history teacher asked me if I liked history, and I said, no, because it's just battles, and Dates, and he said, "Well, that's because women never did anything important." And, and I think that you know, just the just domestic life is interesting and important, and we're getting those stories now, and, and we're dis dismantling the, the the labels, you know. But they are some great ones, and they make for good they make for good fiction. So, yeah. I think there are real political reasons behind why we, we choose to embrace those labels. I think we like to believe. You know, one of the reasons why Axie is a terrific character is that she breaks down this idea of the first street urchin as not being human, right? As, as having a family that doesn't care for its children, right? Because, because her family look for each other, and they look for each other their whole lives, right? Um, and so I think that one of the reasons that we embrace these labels is because they make it easier um, to use them and I'm not saying we as in like we in this room, I'm saying like why that kind of lazy thinking that goes with those labels works is because um, it allows for um, political action and political outs, right? Political inaction. Political, political inaction, you know, sort of yes. Comfort. Particularly we see that when it comes to the lives of the poor. So, and their erasure. I had a question. So it seems like in both of these strong female characters, they're, they're particularly strong because of their time period as well. So do you feel like when you're, when you're developing these strong female characters as 21st century women, you have to be cautious about not making them too much, you know, 21st century feminists that, you know, like, yeah. we're sort of like glorifying sure. these people. You don't want them to be anachronistic, right. you want them to be true right. to their time. Exactly. Do you, do you yeah. feel like it's... You know, you have to be particular. Like, what's your process between like alienate, alienating yourself like this 150 years and, well, and creating these characters? You know. Yeah, that's a good question. I think you can't. I think you can sort of re envision them, but you can't let them do anything that would have never happened. Sure. Or, or never. They would have never thought a certain way. Or, Calamity Jane, for example, is very disliked by the suffragists of the time, who were very anti-alcohol. And so there were massive battles between, um, between her mm -hmm. and some of the madams who were business owners and who we don't like to think of as settlers, but who did help settle 
the West, right? Yeah, people are descended from that. Yes, and I mean, I am a feminist, and I consider my, I consider my feminism very, very important to my writing, but, um, you know, I think that that's, that the way that I apply it is by showing um, the complexity of individuals and not using them as political caricatures. Yeah, you can't sit to them, sorry. So if you, if you were writing a contemporary novel about a female character, how far can you push her before she can tell the bitch? In the eyes of the eyes of the Well, you're looking for an interesting character in an interesting situation, right? So she doesn't have to be, in order to be strong, she doesn't have to be good. She doesn't have to be smart. She doesn't have to be rich. She can be any kind of person, but as long as you look at the complexity of that person. But speaking, speaking as purely as a, maybe as a nuts and bolts kind of thing, and as a reader, you want to read a book about someone that you're not going to hate. <laughs> and um, the first novel that I wrote was concerned with race, and it was concerned with, it was called White Girl, and it was about uh, the, the female protagonist was a fashion model. And like many women in our culture, she was set in the present, and she was obsessed with how she looked. She was obsessed with what people thought of her. She was obsessed with, did she say the right thing? Did she say a stupid thing? Was that a dumb thing? Am I ugly? Am I dumb? Do people, are people looking at me? Which is a contemporary trope. You oh. see that. It's a very subconscious age. But I think reader reaction was, this woman is a carnivorous plant, and I would not want to sit down with her. You, know, you don't have to like, you know, I don't feel writers have to write a nice person or someone that you want to go out and have coffee with. But I think that if you're, as a novelist, you do, people are hungry for role models, and, and women want, you know, we want to know about Calamity Jane's strength. And, and but even if you write not. a character about, like when I say a strong character, I don't think of them in terms of physical strength or, you know, success in battles, uh, political or physical or otherwise. I think of a character who really represents all of the complexity and difficulty of getting up every day and um, and making decisions and living and and being the kind of person that you want to be, or that and confronting the days that you're not that person, and all the kind of real difficulties that you face um, with your physical health with you, the people that you love, with loss, and showing people even, you know, the nicest person in the world thinks terrible things, right? <laughs> people are not showing <laughs> one thing. That's right? interesting. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting, you know? I'm not maybe on that note. Do you think we have maybe one more question? Or not? We can all go. <laughs> Let's all go schmooze. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Thank you.